Good evening, everyone. My name is Vickery Bowles, and I'm the city librarian here at Toronto Public Library. And it's my great pleasure. <laughs> It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here to the Bram and Bluma Appel Salon for this very special evening with the, His Excellency the Right Honourable uh, David Johnson in conversation with Sheila Rogers. As you may know, the Governor General has a tremendous interest in Canadian history. So earlier this afternoon, we gave him a tour of our Baldwin collection of Canadiana. The collection has extensive primary source material on the history of our country, including books, pamphlets, broadsides, manuscripts, and ephemera. It's named after Robert Baldwin, who established responsible, responsible government in pre-Confederation Canada. The collection is housed in the Maryland and Charles Bailey Special Collection Center on the fifth floor of this building. And I encourage you on your next visit to the library to stop in and have a look. It has tremendous uh, resources there and will be of interest to you, I'm sure. But now on to tonight. Let me introduce our host for this evening, the one and only Sheila Rogers, whom you will all know. <laughs> who we all know, I'm sure, from her storied career at CBC Radio, most recently as host of the next chapter on CBC Radio One. Please welcome Sheila Rogers. Welcome, everyone. And uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the First Peoples of this land and thank them for their continued welcome of us to it. I'm going to read you my introduction to His Excellency, and, uh, and here we go. His Excellency, the Right Honourable David Johnston, is in the sixth year of his tenure as the Governor General of Canada. He came to office with a rich and varied background in academia and in public service. Some biographical facts on His Excellency, which I'm hoping he will flesh out during our conversation. He was born in Sudbury. He went to school, attended school in Sault Ste. Marie. He went to Harvard. He played hockey there. He became a law professor. He taught for many years, got involved in administration of a number of universities, and was also the president of the University of Waterloo. Education and giving are two of his great passions, and he promoted these, he has promoted these causes with new programs and initiatives during his tenure at Rideau Hall. He is married to his high school sweetheart, her Excellency Sharon Johnston, and they have five daughters and 12 grandchildren, some of whom are in the audience this evening. Can you make a little noise? That <laughs> I've only met Lucas. But <laughs> His Excellency, uh, the, I'm sorry, the daughters contributed a foreword to His Excellency's new book, The Idea of Canada, Letters to a Nation. They write about receiving many letters from their dad when they went away to school and began to travel as young adults. They also describe their dad as principled, progressive, and loving. And the only thing our father loves as much as his family, they say, is his country. His Excellency began writing a daily letter, a daily, daily letter writing habit many years ago. His new book contains 49 letters written to Canadians, both living and dead. And that outline, all, the, all of them outline his idea of Canada. It is with great honour that I now welcome His Excellency, the Right Honourable David Johnston, the Governor General and Commander in Chief, to the stage. I, I did a little bit of investigative journalism just before we came on stage. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and I spoke with someone who's related to you by marriage. And I said, tell me something about His Excellency. Uh, and he said, I said, how would you describe him? And he said, well, not as that. Not as 
His Excellency. <laughs> so, I bet a Grandpa Book, huh? <laughs> Grandpa Book Shady, it is. is that right? Georgia, is that right? Lucas? <laughs> it, was, it was the father, the father of Lucas. The last time I had the privilege of uh, asking questions on stage with His Excellency was a gathering of the Community Foundations of Canada. And I jokingly said at the end, the only way you'll ever get on my program is if you write a book. And then he said, wait a minute, the fifth edition of the Canadian Securities Regulations has just come out. <laughs> Didn't make it, did it? <laughs> not, not yet. I, I'm waiting the for the sixth. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's a personal family connection oh, to that book, isn't there? Well, that's one of the grandchildren's stories. So I write everything with, with colleagues. So that book, in the first edition, I, I wrote myself when I was Dean of Law at Western, but everything I've done since then, is it's a group effort. And so I think it was the fourth edition of the Canadian Securities Regulation, which is really, really dull and boring, with uh, one of my former students, Kathleen Rockwell, and the galley proofs were in the printer. She sent me an email from Calgary and saying, I was carrying our first child, Noel, while I was working on this book. Do you think we could mention it in the foreword? And I said, mention it. We'll dedicate it to Noel. She said, can we do that? I said, sure, it's our book. So we did. And then an email came back about a week later saying, but you, your first grandchild came into your family as well, our little daughter Emma, who was adopted from an orphanage in Columbia. And so it's dedicated to Noel and Emma. So four years later, I'm in Ottawa reading a book to Emma, grandpa book, she's four years old. And her mom says, why don't you get your favorite book for Grandpa Book? So Emma totters off to her bedroom and comes staggering back with the fourth edition of Canadian <laughs> Securities Regulation. <laughs> Plunks it down on the floor, opens it up to the cover, points to her name. She said, that's my name, Grandpa Book. You wrote this just for me, didn't you? <laughs> yes, dear, I did. She said, but Grandpa Book, when you write another book for me, would you please put some pictures in it? <laughs> That is lovely. How did you become Grandpa Book? Well, I inherited from our great friends, B. Crawford and her family, and the grandchildren of uh, B. and Purdy Crawford, who are godparents mm. to our third child, uh, have uh, even more grandchildren than we have, and we have our 13th expecting in June. And uh, the grandchildren referred to Purdy as Grandpa Book, and somehow I picked it up in our family as well. I have many characteristics from, from Purdy. Those are the better parts of my nature, mm -hmm. and that's one I'm very proud to bear, Grandpa Book. You write a letter to Purdy Crawford. I do, what on did, fairness. Yes, tell us about that. Well, Purdy was, was to be my mentor in law when I had done a couple years of law in England, and then Queens very kindly took me in and gave me the three years of law in one year to fill in the mm -hmm. Canadian gaps. Mm -hmm. and um, And I, early on had signed my articles of indenture. I was going to be indentured to Purdy as an articling student, one of many. And the dean then asked me a month later if I joined the faculty. I said, I can't. Why not? I said, I've signed my articles of indenture. He said, my boy, I have good news. Contracts of personal servitude were outlawed in the British Empire 200 years ago. <laughs> You're a free man. Um, and, uh, and he said, why don't you ask them if they'll release you from articles? And, and the way I tell the story now is, Purdy said, well, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to be a teacher for a year or two. And he said, well, when you've got the courage to face the real world, come and we'll teach you how to practice law. <laughs> so I've renewed that one year leave of absence now for, I think, 51 years. <laughs> And our friends at Osler Hoskin, God bless you if you're in the audience, are absolutely terrified because they think I might come and they're going to have to teach me how to practice law. <laughs> so Purdy then, our relationship could have ended then, but this wasn't Purdy. Uh, so he helped me with my, my starting career. He asked me to come and I carried his bag for one summer when he was, as a volunteer, rewriting the Ontario Securities Act. And so I taught a course in that and then began to write a book in that. And so that's how that relationship developed. And then um, Purdy and I taught a, a course or two together and became wonderful friends of B and the family. And we have a family story that whenever we were moving house, which was frequently, we'd move in with the Crawfords for, I say, three or four months. <laughs> and uh, then we'd have the new house purchased and we moved on. So we've been very close families. You, you wrote to him while he was still alive. Yes. You write to people who are not alive yes. uh, and, and people from Canadian history. Yeah. 
I thought that was sort of what Mackenzie King did, but... Uh... <laughs> well, you know, I, I, the classic idea is you go, go sit in your office in the morning to write a letter. And mm -hmm. Some of these actually are the product of that. Most of them are not. They come in a variety of ways. In the case of the, the letter to Purdy on, on uh, fairness, it's to yeah. Purdy up there because it was a part of the, I was one of the people giving eulogies at his right. funeral and that yeah. was uh, my testimony to my great friend. But John Buchan, for example, Buchan. Um, let me see if I get this right, the 29th Governor General of Canada? Yeah, but that'd be about right. Okay. Yeah, that'd be about right, but, yes, 1935 uh, to 1940. When, when you write a letter to the dead, what, what is going through your mind? Well, first of all, actually talking uh, to them. Uh, I'm not a spiritualist, uh, Pache Mackenzie King. <laughs> but in my office are the names inscribed of all of the governors general, going back to Lord Monk in 1867. I, I look at them each morning, and I have a little conversation or a sense of people. Buchan was very special. Mm -hmm. Buchan wrote 120 books during his lifetime, including yeah. 39 Steps and right. other great yeah. spy thrillers. Yeah and biographies of Augustus Caesar and Sir Walter Scott and you name it. Um, and then um, essays on different things and then novels. In fact, his last book published in 1942, he died in 1940 at Rideau Hall, was uh, Sick Heart River, which was the product of his voyage in northern Canada and, ra and uh, barging down the Mackenzie River probably 38, 39, where he was actually doing the galley proofs of his biography of Augustus Caesar, and at the same time spinning this adventure story in his mind, published after his death. So what I write to Buchan uh, is, is a letter about his view of Canada back in 1935 and 36. He loved Canada and he loved its spaciousness, and he said, you don't know Canada if you haven't seen the North. Mm -hmm. But he was particularly concerned about compartmentalization and rival mm. factions in camps, and I guess we would say two solitudes and more, mm. and hoping that Canada could overcome it. And my letter to him, without saying the experiment is finished, to mm. saying we've come a long ways, mm -hmm. and inclusivity has been such an important part of who we are as Canadians, and that we have fashioned a method of avoiding extremes, and avoiding moving into conflict situations that become zero-sum games. And I think that's part of the genius as to how we've made this work. And we've had to, because the country has not permitted us to quarrel over silly things and to somehow find the common way. And Buchan, of course, would do that remarkably, because he was that pragmatic Scot, mm -hmm. son of the manse, a man of faith, but a man of action, and captured so much of this in what he said. Buchan also was the first to establish one of the Governor General Awards for Excellence, mm -hmm. that for literary excellence. And in my favorite room in Rideau Hall is the library where we have all of the Governor General award-winning books with a portrait of Buchan up there. So I say, send me in there for two weeks and just throw in sandwiches <laughs> so I can read every book. That was Buchan's legacy yeah. to Canada. Your book and Her Excellency's novel, which came out a little earlier this year, must both be excluded from uh, entry into the Governor General's it, awards. It, it is, you're quite right, that. Sheila. And when Sharon was writing her book, which is now in its fourth printing, and I say that oh. shamelessly because all of the royalties for her book go for mental health research at the Royal mm -hmm. Ottawa, and for this book, it's for the Sovereign's Medal on Volunteerism. Um, when uh, Sharon was doing it, she said, uh, do you think it might be, or I think the publisher said, do you think it might be eligible for the Governor General's award? I said, no, dear, not, not at all. Well, she said, what if I, what if I use a gnome diploma? I said, doesn't, doesn't work that way, dear. <laughs> there's, there's a vein that runs throughout the book, and that is uh, a vein of service. Yeah. You mention service often. Yeah. And at one point in a letter to uh, the former um, chief of the defense staff, Walter Natinchuk, you say, service is an act of love. I, I want to ask you more about that specific letter to him, but first of all, how did the idea of service get its hooks into you? Well, first of all, I quote from something my wife has passed on, uh, <clears throat> love is uh, service made visible, number mm -hmm. one. And I think in that letter we quote a Scottish poet, Buchan would be approved, Joanna Bailey, who said, um, Service is the rent we pay for our space on earth. Yes, yeah. And uh, I guess in my, there's another letter about faith, which is a mm -hmm. part of my makeup, which I guess moves one down that path. But Walt, you really have to know Walt one Machinchuk, one of these extraordinary Canadians. Walt was the chief of defense staff when I 
was installed in this job and I became commander in chief and I was on a program with your colleague Peter Mansbridge, I think day three, and mm -hmm. Peter being Peter and very forthright said, will you wear the uniform? And I hadn't prepared the answer. And my answer was, well, Peter, I, I don't think so because I don't have a military tradition mm -hmm. um, and I would not want to be either having any false representation or in any way trespassing on the great honor and service of our people who wear the uniform, okay. Canadians. 30 days later, 31, 32 days later, Walt and I were out in Afghanistan and I was wearing combat uniforms because you had to blend in a bit. Uh, we were out beyond the wire. We were actually about 12 kilometers from where Osama bin Laden uh, took his first uh, hiding place. So it was a very interesting part of the world. And uh, Walt said to me, uh, on behalf of the men and women of the armed sources, sir, we would be very honored if you would, when you take that combat uniform off back home, put on the, the, um, the regular uniform, I said, I will, and I'm so proud to wear it. In the letter to Walt, I'm speaking about service, and there's one part of that story I tell where Walt, when he was stepping down after three years of three and a half years as commander in chief, invited me to what I later realized was a very special event. It was the gathering after his retirement of his old buddies, the people that had started along, and I was a new buddy, and I was so honored to be there. And he said, let me kind of bare my soul. He said, I, I've been so lucky in my career, and I'm now finishing my military career, my service career as such. Uh, he said, I was a cadet in Winnipeg, and uh, then I joined, a, got my university degree in reserve officer training, and, and I was uh, in the Dragoons, the tank guys, mm -hmm. and I guess I was very lucky, but I was always being promoted earlier than my age would show. And I reached mid-30s, and I'm promoted to lieutenant colonel, and I never believed that Walt Natinchuk from Winnipeg would be a lieutenant colonel in the Canadian Army. He said, I was on cloud nine for about 24 hours. And then I started to come down off the cloud and then some uneasiness in my stomach. And then he said I was transformed and it was because all of a sudden life was not about Walt Natinchuk climbing different mountains and reaching the peak and being applauded for it. Uh, it was about the thousand people for whose lives I was responsible and for whose development I had a responsibility. It moved from me to we. And once you move from the first person singular to the first person plural, the world becomes a whole lot more interesting place. Now in Walt's case, that happened at about age three, not 35. <laughs> but that's service. Yes. And I guess in my kind of anchor points, I really do believe that we are social animals and that we are here on earth or put here on earth um, to, um, to create a better place by reaching out and helping our neighbors writ large and that we do find our best fulfillment when we've discovered that moving from me to we makes this place a whole lot more interesting. How did that notion of service filter through in all your years when you were involved in education and teaching? I guess it's what's kept me there because I believe the cause and the company are very good. The cause of higher education and education of any kind, actually especially early education because you start young people on the path is so liberating and apart from one's family, influence, which is the most important thing. It's the second most important thing. And in Canada, we could, should be so proud of our public education system because we work very hard at a, as a society for equality of opportunity. And we must have equality of opportunity and excellence too, to see those as mutually mm -hmm. reinforcing objectives, not conflicting. And we've done well on equality of opportunity, but we have a greater ways to go. And I'll talk about that later if you ask me. I was just struck by the fact as our five daughters pursued their career that they're all in the public service. And I don't think we've brainwashed them around the dinner table, but I, Sharon's in public service. And I guess we've uh, indicated to our children that we derive great joy from that in our lives. And I know that each of them great, derives great joy from the public service that they do. You, you talk about um, the strides that have been made in inclusivity in education. Uh, and, and opportunity for education, but one of the glaring holes, and you call this gap an actual chasm, is in the education of First Nations students. Kids chasm students. is the right yeah. word, Sheila, for that. Uh, I often show an OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, chart, 32 countries or so developed that are part of that organization. And that chart attempts to trace social mobility on the basis of the degree to which children reach or exceed their parents' level of education. Mm -hmm. 
as an indication of upward movement. So they take the 32 countries and they divide them into quintiles. And where do they stand by that index? Well, Canada, you'll be glad to know, is number one in the top 80%, the first four quintiles. So you think about the bottom quintile, 20, we're going to be up there, top one, two, three, four. A rising tide raises all boats. We're in the bottom third, mm. the bottom third. And that's the beginning of the chasm. 4% of our population are First Nations people. And the gap, just in terms of educational output, educational success, resources in, is really, really quite huge. And so, as we come out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and that terrible experiment with residential schools and find our way to reconciliation, objective number one should be to eliminate that chasm, that gap, as fast as we possibly can with measured progress that really does get at the very basic features of why that gap exists. And as we do, as one of my friends say, uh, nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. That is, this is a journey we take together with a very clear understanding of the history and culture of those Canadians. I'll say one other thing, Sharon and I were in North Bay a week or two ago, and we were at Nipissing University mm -hmm. in a program on exactly that, reducing that gap. And one of the leaders said, we non Aboriginal people must unlearn to learn. Mm. We have a lot yes. to unlearn yeah. before we can then learn and make the journey together. And there's Nipissing University where Mike Degagne is the first Aboriginal yeah. president of a university in Canada. Extraordinary. So, Mike yeah. Degagne is the president of Nipissing University, an extraordinary leader, uh, comes from a very uh, interesting background from outside the university. And Nipissing is, uh, is a university that uh, is overwhelmingly strong in education. It came out of a teacher's college, and I don't know what the percentage of students, but I dare say that 40% of Nipissing mm -hmm. students are in education, so it's a great place to be reading a pioneer in these new pathways for education. But you know, the exciting thing is it's happening in universities and colleges all across the country. And we must understand, we must walk with our First Nations colleagues, walk in their moccasins, understand their history, and then find the ways together of eliminating that chasm and gap. One of your letters is to, yeah. here, here. Yeah. I might add, your wife, Her Excellency, is an honorary witness to the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Does she Commission. Ever, ever take it seriously? We were chatting with a colleague um, earlier this evening at the reception, speaking about uh, Sharon being up at uh, one of the Northwestern Ontario Reserves, KI, on one of the trips she's made to several. And on that occasion, she was there with uh, Ruth Ann Onley, the uh, wife of the former Lieutenant Governor of David, Ontario, yeah, that David. lovely man, David Onley. So Sharon and Ruth Ann have had uh, some great visits together, and they have been there as witnesses of another kind. Well, the former chair of the, the TRC, Murray Sinclair, now Senator Sinclair, said it was education that got us into this mess, and it's education that will get us out. Yeah, yeah. And, and you write a letter to James Bartleman, an, yeah. another lieutenant governor of Ontario, yes. former lieutenant governor, and a member of the Chippewa of, uh, of the Rama yeah. First Nation. And part of, part of Jim, James Bartleman's story is that, that as I understand it, um, grew up in the reserve near Perry Sound and was befriended by an American tourist who saw James as a really promising young man. He had a card to the local library at a very young age and borrowed the books incessantly. And uh, that family uh, sponsored him, gave him a scholarship to go as far as he could go in university. He went very far, became part of the Foreign Service in a very distinguished career, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. And when, when Jim was Lieutenant Governor, he began a project that I recall um, learning about as a university president when I was at McGill, uh, and that was to collect books that Jim would take into the reserves in Northern Ontario to buttress the library program that was there. That's now flourished into a program led by Frontier College that provide not only the books, but summer literary programs with bright young Frontier College teachers that uh, are now going across the country to provide a summer exposure to literature for, for younger people. So what did you want to say to James Bartleman in thank your you. letter? Well, I would say to him, thank you. Uh, but uh, I think in the, the message to him, it would be uh, help us to understand that all Canadians uh, have a responsibility to, to care for our neighbors, to work with our neighbors, 
uh, in this particular area, and to be sure that we're doing it uh, sensibly and wisely uh, with, a, um, with a, uh, a collaborative approach. I often talk about lessons my children have learned from exposure to other cultures and other countries, and there are four important things I've seen develop in them. The fourth one, which is maybe the most important, is empathy. Not sympathy, but empathy. The ability to walk in somebody else's shoes, and then as you walk, to understand their discomfort and together help them through that. That's the kind of thing that I would say to Jim that help us to be empathetic and wise and thoughtful and Canadian uh, in uh, getting rid of that gap. I could make this a question, and this could be the shortest question I ever ask you. Clara Hughes. Superb, remarkable. Uh, a few more words. Uh, Clara, I just love, Sharon loves Clara. Uh, we're going to, we say, we're going to do a, a cross-country bike trip for 2017. We're going to do the Trans-Canada Trail, but we're going to do it on tandem bicycles, so Clara does all the pedaling. <laughs> And I do all the sharing. Sharon will do the pedaling as well, but I'll do the steering. <laughs> <laughs> Clara, as you know, uh, is the only person I think who's medaled as much as she has both in the summer and the Winter Olympic Games. That is true. In speed skating yeah. and bicycling. And Clara medals in everything, medals, M-E-D-A-L-S, in everything she does. She just won it, Canada Reads uh, as she represented the illegal by Lawrence Hill. Yeah. And last year finished uh, Clara's ride across Canada for mental right. health, and she has been such an outstanding person in helping us to deal with mental health and realize two important things, that we must overcome the stigma of mental health and see it as an illness like any other illness, and secondly, realize mm -hmm. that there is such opportunity to deal with mental health and establish the cure, the stabilization. We, we've learned so much in the last 20 years about the human brain, and there's so much hope for people who suffer from these difficult illnesses, and this is a case where collective action makes a difference, to overcome the stigma, to reach out to our colleagues and our peers who are suffering, and say together, you know, we can lick this thing, and there, there's real hope and answers there. I know there's one person who's wildly, quietly applauding in the audience right now, and that's Phil Upshaw from Moods Disorders Canada. Um, I, I should say, of course, you wrote a letter to Clara Hughes. I didn't just sort of drop her randomly into the conversation. There is a letter in this book. And, and what was it you wanted to express to Clara Hughes? Well, again, I think that was a letter of thank you, but it was written to Clara and, be, Claire and beyond to say there is no hope. Uh, in this terrible battle. And Sharon has been especially mm -hmm. strong on mental health and has brought me along in it. Sharon's a physio and occupational therapist by background and did her PhD in rehabilitation medicine. And her first assignment was in a children's psychiatric ward, so she has a great interest in this. And um, uh, she has led the work of the uh, vice regal couple uh, to focus on mental health and to to extend this message to all Canadians that we work to overcome the stigma and there is great hope in the healing powers that are existing and developing every day. And Clara is leading the charge. Indeed she is. I, I want to ask you, I actually want to go back to Harvard with you. In fact, I probably read about you without knowing you when I read Love Story by Eric Siegel in the early 1970s, but the captain of the Harvard team that Oliver plays on is Davy Johnston. Yeah, there's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of romantic license in that. <laughs> One uh, scene has, has the Harvard team lo losing to Cornell uh, in the Ivy League final. Ken Dryden, a great friend, was the great goaltender at Cornell just a couple years after me. But the way you're, I often say to Ken, Harvard never lost to Cornell, ever. And Ken says, well, it says right here in Love Story they did. I said, Ken, that's romantic fiction. Don't believe a word of it. <laughs> that's a, I loved Harvard. Um, and only at Harvard would a professor of classics um, be writing stories about undergraduate students. And he took an interest in in athletes, Eric actually lived across the hall from us because unmarried professors lived in the residences where teaching was done. And one of my roommates was a basketball player and the other was a baseball player and I played football and hockey. 
we had the sports covered, and uh, Eric would come over on a Sunday night and say, Johnston, you're running with me at six o'clock in the morning in the Charles River. Yes, sir, I would. Augustine, you are. Tuesday, Combs, you are. So we got to know him, and we didn't realize that he was taking notes. Uh, he And he he wrote five or six novels based partly on, on, on characters he'd known. In fact, the story and love story was a Boston Brahmin falls in love with the beautiful Roman Catholic mm -hmm. Italian from and the family are against it. They get married and so on and then she contracts mm -hmm. leukemia and she dies. Right. Um, and that story was true but he brought other characters in. Mm -hmm. But he always changed the name. Oliver Barrett in the book in fact is Adam Winthrop in real life who lived a floor below it. Governor Winthrop was the first governor of Massachusetts in 1620. So Adam had a little bit of Boston Brahma in him. He was actually a lovely guy. He played on the junior varsity hockey team. But for some reason, I was the only character whose name he kept in the book, and there you are. I, I do want to ask you about hockey, um, because you yourself, I mean, there's so much research now coming out about concussions and what concussions do. And uh, you had three uh, before you were 20. And you played hockey without a helmet, but eventually did play with a helmet. That's an interesting story. I mean, that's a story of Sault Ste. Marie, Sheila, which uh, town Sharon and I love. Great community. I was 15, and I had, I think, three concussions in about three months, two from football mm -hmm. and one in hockey. And our family doctor, Dr. Black, a marvelous man, said, well, he said, you're now wearing a helmet if you're going to play any more hockey. I said, Dr. Black, I can't wear a helmet. The boys will laugh at me. Nobody wore helmets in those days. Charlie Burns in the NHL did, but he had a plate in his head. That's why he needed a helmet. And Dr. Black said, well, he said, you have a very interesting choice that he said, you cannot wear a helmet and you won't play hockey and the boys won't laugh at you. Or you can wear a helmet, play hockey, and the boys will laugh at you. So I wore a helmet. <laughs> and, um, and then I've been, I love the game of hockey and I love it for a number of reasons, but it's the fastest game on earth because you're on skates and you can go about 60 or 70% mm -hmm. faster. And it requires very intricate teamwork to establish the mismatches which permit you to score and, the, and you avoid the mismatches so that you don't get scored upon. But it's also a virtuoso game. You can't simply follow pattern plays. You can start with a pattern, but then it becomes a bit of a virtuosity mm -hmm but all within a pattern of developing the mismatch. So it's that very, at very high speed. That's the beauty of the game, that intricate teamwork. Why on earth do you have to have boxing matches in the game? Three reasons are given by the people that promote this. One is that you need enforcers to protect your good players. I don't believe that. Other sports don't, don't need the enforcers. Secondly, it puts spectators in the seats. It might for a first season or two of roller derby and ice, but if you want people to watch games, it'll be different. People don't watch the Olympics or international competitions for the boxing, they watch it for the skill. And the third argument is that they, you need, because it's such a fast game, you need a, an escape valve, and if you didn't have the fighting, you'd have more sticking, you'd have more spearing, etc. You just penalize that out of existence. And, and I really hope, as we see more evidence of concussions, and how devastating they are, and how repeated concussions are, are, are really, really dangerous. But we'll rearrange the rules to stop fighting, to stop headshots of any kind, and to stop blindside boarding, at least start with those three. But my message on this one, and I guess this is a bit of a crusade, it's to the parents, because I want my grandchildren to play that game I love, but I have, two twin grandchildren who like to play hockey, but their mom and dad are docs, and one of them is a major team room pediatrician whose expertise is concussions. And, and what he would say is we're learning more about the brain, and the child's brain is still developing up to age 21. And repeated concussions are very, very bad for a developing brain. Mm -hmm. So we rearrange the rules so that we minimize that kind of risk, point one. And point two, we're not thugs as a country. We're people that compete hard, vigorously, but we observe the rules and we shake hands with our opponent at the end of the game. That's what I want my grandchildren to learn about the game of hockey because they apply it in the game of life. You and I are walking down the street, Sheila, and, and you happen to bump into me, perhaps you're reading a book or something. My Canadian response is, I'm so sorry, yes. even before you get it out of your mouth because I'm minimizing the situation and maybe saying, gee, I should have been watching a bit out for you. 
We avoid those conflicts. Well, that's the way we want to raise our children and grandchildren, and that's how we want to be known around the world. And so that's why I say, <laughs> I, that, letter, that letter is called Recovering the Game, and it's to Cooney Weiland, who is our coach at Harvard, a man, a beloved man, who had a grade 10 education out of Seaforth, was the leading scorer in the National Hockey League in 1931-1932, was the beginning of the Kraut line, which is a great line for Boston. Coached the Bruins to a Stanley Cup championship in 37-38, and then he got into an argument with Art Ross, was fired. And so he was the first coach at Harvard to be a non-Harvard graduate and not a university graduate, and we learned an enormous amount from that coach. I'm just um, trying to recall how the, the poet Al Purdy described hockey, and I think it was a murderous ballet. Uh, I know David Staines is in the audience. He could, he could confirm that. He was the editor of the New Canadian Library. But uh, he had a point, didn't he? Yeah, and, and such a tragedy. It's such a beautiful game. And it's a game that everyone could play. I played defense at 145, 150 pounds, uh, that's more difficult today. Uh, and not only the player is bigger and stronger, but the equipment is, is so much more offensive. It's there to protect, but if you examine the elbow pads or the shoulder pads that modern, even amateur players wear, uh, they are lethal weapons uh, when they hit you in the side of the head or the jaw, et cetera. You can redesign that stuff so it's leather, it protects. Um, and there's so many things you can do just to rearrange the game so it's a sensible and really great game. Your Excellency, I know we're running out of time. We have, uh, according to my watch, about three minutes left. Uh, and there are, there are, before we hear uh, questions from the audience, there are a lot of directions I'd love to move in. But I, I want to ask, uh, when, you know, when you went to Harvard, you had every intention of coming back to Canada. Yeah. These days, that might not happen. It might not be quite as attractive. What's the argument for someone who says on a scholarship as you were to come back to this country I instead think to draw of the country. staying in the States? Uh, yeah. And I think that must, that, that must be the argument that is presented. This is such a great country. Come and make your fortune here. But if you go elsewhere, I think that's fine as well. My high school principal, who was a really fine man, would not write my letter of recommendation to Harvard because he was worried that I would stay there. His first point began by saying, I don't want you going to a second-rate university. And I said, well, sir, uh, there are third-rate, second-rate, first-rate universities in the United States. Uh, this is a good one. Well, he says, you, you won't come back. I said, I, I'm sh pretty sure I will, but, you know, sir, that really is my choice to make. And I, I don't worry about a brain grain, grain from Canada. In fact, I, I think it's important that we have international experience. Only 3% of our undergraduate students in Canadian universities have a term abroad or a volunteer work experience. That should be 100%. And I'll tell you why with the three minutes left. I've watched my five daughters beginning international exchanges at age 12, and I've watched their exposure to different cultures, even in this country, the inclusivity. Four things have happened to them. I mentioned the fourth, which is empathy. The other three are the first thing that happens is their curiosity becomes enhanced by exposure to difference. The second thing that happens is their judgment becomes better because they because they don't accept the first evidence, and they don't come into something with a kind of prejudice, uh, and they look for the other side of the story. And the third thing that happens is they become more taller, not in the sense that you're different, and that's okay, that's all right, but you're different and I'm interested in why you're different. And that, to me, should be the signature of what is a Canadian, that we embark upon that. So, sure, um, if you're a bright young student, um, go to the best university in the world in your particular discipline. And, and sharpen your mind as much as you can and come back to Canada, I think 90% of you will. The 10% who don't uh, may and then come back, as many do in Silicon Valley. And the reason when I, the principal wouldn't write the letter, the history teacher was also the coach of the football team. And he said, I'll write the wretched letter for you. He said, you've been a, a big frog in a very small pond. You've got to go to a place uh, where you get your head knocked off by people who are tougher than you are, uh, and where you're really challenged. Uh, and he was absolutely right. It was marvelous for me. Uh, scared the willies out of me in the first three months. My first uh, grade on, we wrote an essay every week, and I thought I'd written Paradise Lost in my first one. It came back D minus. <laughs> I went to see my professor. I said, sir, I didn't think they had grades that low. <laughs> he said, uh, join the club, son. He said, there are quite a few others there with D minus as you'll come along. And it was terrific. 
I remember hearing uh, about Peter Zosky going up to the north and going into a school and uh, a young fellow in a kindergarten class said, why are you famous? And you had, and Peter actually said, I don't really know, it, that it was, that it, it was about luck. But My you had, wife would say the answer you should give is, is what do you mean by famous? <laughs> <laughs> she was once asked by a reporter, uh, can you explain your husband's success? And she said, would you re please repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, uh, to add insult to injury, uh, only my wife, I was her first date at 13, she knows a bit about me. She said, <laughs> she said what do you mean by success? Well, he's been a university president for 25 or 26 years. He must be worth something. Oh, she said that. Well, she said, all you have to do to last as long as my husband has as a university president is to be totally lacking in a sense of humor, and he's perfect for the job. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which has been proven wrong tonight, if, you, if you'll forgive me. But you have when this... you hear her side of the story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, there's, there's a wonderful letter that begins the book. Uh, that is, it's a letter to an unknown Inuit boy who said to you when you were in Repulse Bay, who are you anyway? Well, let me tell that story because it really is fun. And we start that book because it caused me to ask who am I and to explain a little bit and bear the soul. So Sharon and I were up at Repulse Bay. It was three, four Augusts ago. And for particular events we had there in other northern communities. And it, it turned out when we arrived, they were running a Terry Fox run, the most northerly community to do a Terry Fox run. We participated in most of them, maybe all of them for 31, 32 years. There are about 120, 130 countries around the world now that have a Terry Fox run. Think of that young 20, 21 year old for whom there are runs in 130 countries around the world to raise money for cancer research. Ain't that something? Ain't that so here we are saying, well, we're running the race. It's a five kilometer race and I'm starting it. And Sharon's here about two minutes to go. Little Inuit boy about age eight comes up and pushes me. He says, who are you anyway? <laughs> I'm the governor general of Canada. Well, what's your name anyway? <laughs> My name is David. Well, David, how old are you anyway? <laughs> I'm 70 years old. 70 years old? I didn't think anybody could get that old. <laughs> So we finished the race, and I looked and I found him, and I went and I put my arm around his shoulder, and I said, not dead yet, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best use of anyway that I have ever heard. And, and I hope you'll write to Terry one morning when you go and, and feel the, the urge to write to someone. Well, if you promise to have me in another conversation, <laughs> Sheila, then I'll write another uh, listen, book. Listen, <laughs> as long as it's not Canadian securities regulation, we're, we're in. <laughs> But that's the sixth edition. <laughs> <laughs> if you dedicate it. <laughs> Your Excellency, what a great honor and a great pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> and don't go away. Oh, my God. Um, but here we go. I'll just do... We've got time for a couple anyway. Your Honor. One which minute I think is Your Excellency. Okay. Do you have any thoughts or comments regarding the 90th birthday of Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth being celebrated tomorrow? What would you like to share with us? Well, number one, it occurs at 2.45 a.m., so if you want to stay up a little bit late, you'll have the exact <laughs> moment. Number two, um, the um, formal celebrations will be in London on June 9th to 10th. Three, uh, I have written to her on behalf of all Canadians and expressed our enormous admiration for the integrity, the steadiness, and the thoughtfulness that she has brought to 60 plus years on the throne. And she is the longest serving uh, monarch in uh, a thousand years of British history. And my, what grace and what strength she's brought to that position. So we wish her well. This is a question from Victoria Lacroix. What made you want to be the Governor General? Well, I didn't want to uh, because... Um, <laughs> well, it didn't work out in that case, did it? <laughs> what does Yogi Berra say when you come to a fork in the road, pick it up? Uh, <laughs> I've never heard that. I've heard take it. <laughs> I'm sure I made it up. I often say everything goes back to Aristotle anyway. <laughs> Um, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> eh? <laughs> uh, 
I hadn't thought very much about it, but I got a call one day uh, because the uh, Prime Minister had set up a committee of five people to, I guess with a, they must have had a job description and to look at potential candidates across the country. And um, the call from the appointments officer was, would you be interested? And I said, well, yeah, I guess I am. I'm now 27 years as a university president and you can't go on forever in that. I suppose I, I should do a real job some way. This one is too, too much fun. Um, and, um, but I said, look, I know how these things go. When you get down to a short list, you know, of a few people and you want me to give a serious, I will. So he phones the next day, he said, we have a short list. I said, oh, I said, <laughs> we have a very short list. <laughs> oh, I said, well, look, to be frank with you, I, I certainly have an interest. I love the country and I don't know much about the job, but, but you know, I typically, take a week or so with important decisions like this, and the three or four people I take advice from, and of course Sharon and I would have to talk about it. Oh, no, 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 he said, you can't take advice from anyone. I said, I can't take advice from my wife? No, no, no. I said, well, I think the answer is no, because if I say yes now, <laughs> and I have this job, she'll say, good luck, dear, you're off to Ottawa on your own. <laughs> but um, Mr. and Mrs. Harper invited us to come up to Ottawa, and we had a wonderful Saturday evening dinner with them, and, and uh, Mr. Harper said, uh, I know David's all right, we're gonna have to persuade Sharon, and Sharon agreed at the end of the evening, and that was that. So you don't go looking for these positions, and I guess when I was asked it, I would say today what a gift it is and how lucky we are to have had the chance to do what we've done the last five and a half years. This is a question I'm very interested in myself. Um, I, I'm a chancellor at a, a university. There are a number of chancellors here tonight, I know. Tell but us which one, Sheila. The University of Victoria. And what a place. Go Vikes, go. <laughs> okay. Um, and watch what they're doing on Aboriginal education. It's really, it really, thank you for saying yeah. that. Including They've, taking the courses to the north and developing professionals, lawyers, law teachers, schools, that's nurses. Right. Yeah. That, we could, we'll take this off stage. Well, uh -huh. because here's, here's a question from, uh, from a member of the audience, anonymous. Why is post-secondary school so expensive in Canada? Well, on a relatively scale, it's not, as a matter of fact. If you compare our prices with the United States, uh, they uh, diminish quite considerably, even state universities, which are publicly supported. If you compare tuition fees in the United Kingdom today, they're vastly higher than ours. <laughs> Uh, for me, accessibility in higher education is very important. And the approach that I've long argued for is make grants and loans available to people who can't afford the undergraduate degree in their, uh, from uh, their family means, um, and have those loans forgivable and paid back through the income tax system. So if you do well, um, you have an extra point or two in your tax and you pay off your loan over a period of time. And if you don't, if your income is never over X dollars, $25,000, $30,000 a year, we write it off. Um, and, and that means that the student has a stake in the education if, in fact, they have the means to do it. If they don't, we'll provide it, and you'll have a chance to use the increased income earning power that you have from that education to pay for it through the tax system. Here's a, this is, there are a couple of questions, and I'm going to ask both of them um, from, it looks like, Louis or Lori, forgive me. In moments when you found yourself discouraged, either as a young person or now, what were or are your strategies to rise above? Well, this gets personal. This is bearing the soul. One of the letters, uh, one of the hardest ones that I had to write was on faith, and it's to Andrew Bennett, our, um, our um, ambassador for uh, religious freedom. And uh, uh, for me, that's been my rock. I'm, uh, when I was at Harvard, I took the modest course in the Episcopal Church to become a lay minister in the Episcopal Church. And during the summers, I was courting Sharon, uh, I would uh, relieve the Anglican minister on the three Indian reserves around the community and would, would take those services. So for me, that's uh, been a, a, a fundamental strength in my life. My family's been very, very important in times of challenge and stress. And the third thing I'd say, which I say in another letter to young people is, um, um, my favorite lines from Shakespeare are Hamlet. It's act one, scene three, Polonius to his son Laertes, who's off to university in Germany from Denmark, and Polonius is the fool, and Shakespeare very often used the fools to speak wisdom in his plays, and the lines are, to thine and self be true, and it shall follow as the night the day that canst, thou canst not then be false to any one. So you're true to yourself, but what is yourself? This who am I question to the young Inuit boy, 
and yourself is partly a moral compass. It's your fundamental values, and, and that's a rock and a refuge that provides you guidance. And out of that, I think, in difficult decisions, you manage your way, and when you find the challenging and difficult times, I, I think you find the opportunities from hope through your experiences with others um, and drawing sustenance and support and encouragement and inspiration from them. And so for me, that's been a, a very helpful way to make the journey through life. The second question, this, this may get the award for best question. Are the corgis soft? Are the corgis soft? <laughs> the corgis are interesting. We, we were, we were, uh, it was, I think the last time at one we were in London had the great privilege of having lunch with the Queen and we came in and sat down with her and we were just tucking into the soup when she turned and she whistled, you know, as you would whistling sheep or a sheepdog or something like that. The door opens and these seven corgi dogs came charging into the room. We have dogs so they were all over me and I like dogs. And I guess I must have liked one so much that he turned over on his back and lay up with his legs <laughs> up and scratch his belly. And she turned to me and she said, you're all right, the dog's like you. <laughs> so the answer is, the belly was soft. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for those questions. Uh, your Excellency, what is your favorite, or who, I beg your pardon, who is your favorite philosopher? My favorite? Philosopher. Philosopher, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, many, I suppose, um, I, I love to read. Um, I don't think Will and Ariel Durant are philosophers, uh, but they're history of ideas people. And I've read through those eight or nine volumes now two times, and I'm starting to work my way through. I've reached the age where I read books again because they mean so much to me. So that's important. Um, a, a couple of philosophers that are historians, but I get a lot of philosophy, are, are James Michener and Pierre Burton. I think I've read every book that each of those two people have written, Pierre Burton because it's so Canadian, uh, and you learn a philosophy from Canadian history, and Michener who is a writer of historical fiction, and it's a wonderful way to get your history, but it's filled with philosophical messages you study history. Um, philosophers as such, I mean we all took our Socrates and our Aristotle mm -hmm. and that remains with us, but for me I guess the philosophy comes more lively as I see it in action, and I actually see it in action in reading history. Here's a question. Do you think it's important to define Canadian culture? No, I wouldn't define it. I wouldn't define it, but I'd let it free. Uh, and I'm so impressed with uh, the flourishing of the arts in Canada. Um, we see it with the different awards that um, are part of uh, the honor system. And my friend Doug Knight, who uh, chairs the uh, Governor General of Performing Arts uh, Award, uh, tells me of a study that was done of 150 or so nations to name their 10 most uh, important and best known people around the world. Canada was the only nation where all 10 of the 10 were people from the arts. Interesting, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you think about it for a moment. I mean, in the last year we won two Nobel Prizes. One in physics, and I'd love to go into the story of Art McDonald and that mine mm -hmm. in Sudbury. I was born beside that tallest smokestack and that mine and using it to to really get at fundamental questions of physics, but Alice Munro, mm -hmm. and she got it for short stories. And short stories that are very, very Canadian, eh? Indeed. Oh, absolutely. And I could go on and on. Yeah. Celine Dion, mm -hmm. there's a letter to Celine Dion. Right. For, what's the number, is it 20 million albums that she's shown? And the the letter to Celine is interesting because it is, it is it is validating her voice as a French Canadian and the French culture. Now music is a universal language, but how proud we are to have a Celine Dion expressing the best of Canadian musical culture around the world. And I could go on and on. And we could go on and on. I'm just going, oh gosh, we can go on for another five minutes. That's so exciting. I love it when that happens. Um, what do you see Canada becoming over the next 30 years in terms of immigration and our cultural mix? Well, number one, we are an experiment, and so is the US, in saying we can have streams of immigrants from many different cultures and make it work. Uh, and I think that's the, one of the great triumphs of Canada. We have made it work, not perfectly, but we made it work. Angela Merkel was with us about two and a half years ago 
remarkable woman, and she's a research chemist by background, and I am who I am, so I was cross-examining her on whether the European Union, and she was cross-examining me on how does this crazy quilt Canada work? It's so mixed up in terms of the streams, but somehow it seems to manage. I gave her a book, Why Nations Fail, by James Robinson and Darren Asamoglu, MIT and Harvard, but it's part of a project of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, another great Canadian triumph, I might say, Fraser Mustard's great invention. And their thesis is why nations fail. Those nation societies, communities that are inclusive in their politics and their economics are in a virtual upward spiral. Those that are extractive in their economics and politics are in a downward spiral. Not inclusive, exclusive, but inclusive and extractive. Her English is very good, but for five minutes she broke into German with her four or five colleagues, and they came up with 17 different synonyms in German for extractive. And it, it's the very sinister side of the lack of inclusivity. We have made that work, not perfectly, but that will be the great test, I think, of whether we can make that work and see our culture enriched by those different streams coming together. As Saint-Exupéry said in Le Petit Prince, I am different from you, but because I am different, I do not diminish you, I enrich in you. Yes, it's beautiful. I, I want to ask, this is a, a, the last question, um, and perhaps when you, when you see His Excellency at the signing table, if I've missed your question, if it's short, you can ask him there. But we're coming up to the, the sesquicentennial of, yep. of Canada, and you are, you are charging us in this book to go out and give. Right on. Right on. The installation address was entitled A Smart and Caring Country, A Call to Service. Three pillars, family and children, learning and innovation, philanthropy and volunteerism. And both of those adjectives are important, smart and caring. They reinforce one another. So my dream for Canada for our 150th next year would be at a birthday you make a gift, and the gift would be what gift do each of us want to make to ensure that this country is smarter, more caring, keener minds and kinder hearts for the next 5, 10, 15, 25 years, including that chasm or gap we spoke about before. And for me, that will be the real fulfillment of, of the nation. Nahid Nenshi, that wonderful mayor of Calgary, when he began his tenure as mayor, had an advisory group. He said, I want an idea of something that can move Calgary. The idea they gave him was ask each Calgarians to do three things to improve Calgary each month or each year, and he thought it was a corny idea, so he dismissed it. Finally, they wore him down. He decided to try it. He says it's worked wonderful. So Nahid is now saying for the 150th, ask each Canadian, what three things can you do to improve Canada, beginning in your neighborhood, year by year, for the next years or so. Not a bad way to celebrate a birthday. Great. Now, do I get a chance to ask you some questions? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Very definitely not. Uh, we have one minute left. I can't believe this. You must have been a broadcaster in a past life because your timing is, oh, is I, superb. My, my ambition, Sheila. <laughs> well, you could mow my lawn any time, I'm pretty sure. But uh, the, the smart and caring country that you, you want to build and are working on building, you say we have to be smart first before we're caring in one of the letters. Yeah, I wouldn't push that too hard. Okay. Um, if you take a three-year-old, how smart do you expect a three-year-old to be? I expect you, them to be caring. Uh, mm -hmm. They find their way. Um, so it's, I, w there, I don't think I'd put a proportionality on it. I don't know what, I guess one comes from the heart or one comes from the brain or perhaps one's left brain and the other's right brain. The important thing is to get them right. And I say all the important things in life I've learned from my children, my grandchildren. Last night we were at a function like this and we had four or five of the Ottawa grandchildren there and we got on to smart and caring and that it's everybody's game, not just old people or even middle-aged people. I said, all four of our Canadian dollars have been involved in sponsoring refugee families in one way or another. And so the number three daughter and her husband are docs. So their particular contribution has been to add refugee patients to their patient base. So their son, Nick, is nine years old. And Nick says, Mommy, Daddy, I'd, I'd like to do something too for the Syrian refugee families, a new family, but I'm not a doctor, so I can't deal with their medical needs, and I don't have a lot of money in my piggy bank, but I have books, I love to read books. Maybe I could sell some to my grade three students, my colleagues. So he did, and he raised $90. 
And then the teacher said, that's wonderful, Nick, but we have a problem. Our school believes in charitable work. They, they encourage kids. But we have three identified charities. One is a school in Kenya. The other is United Way Ottawa. And the third is, I think, a woman's shelter. But he said, that's not Syrian refugees. But then she said, let's look at the United Way. It's got about 150 agencies that they support. And she identified three that were refugees. So that was fine. And then the principal learned about it. He says, well, Nick, maybe you and your two chums from grade three could organize book sales for the entire school. Interesting for a nine-year-old. Taya is our 10-year-old, uh, Chelsea. And uh, her, her family sponsored a Syrian family. And she said, I wanted to do something as well. So she organized bake sales with two of her chums. And I said, I will match you dollar for dollar. They're at $1,800 as we speak, <laughs> without the match. <laughs> so if any of you have a little spare change to help a poor old fellow, I'd be grateful. <laughs> so what's my point? My, my point is that, that you want both, but if you want your caring to be as impactful as possible, try, try to be smart about it. Uh, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Uh, if your neighbor is injured or elderly and their driveway needs shoveling out and you're shoveling out oh, yours, go over and shovel it out. This is Grandpa Book, and, uh, and I thank you so much, Your Excellency. It's been wonderful to have you here. Thank wonderful you. to be with you. And thank you. You're so good. <laughs> <laughs>